Good morning, everybody. My name is Keith Barfield, and I'm a founding member with BMSS Advisors and CPAs. BMSS was established in 1991 with the goal of providing peace of mind and exceptional advisory, tax, and accounting services to our clients. Over the past 32 years, we have grown throughout the state of Alabama, now have five offices and over 250 team members within the BMSS family of companies. Our clients cover a variety of industries, including manufacturing, construction, technology, nonprofit, and government contracting, to name a few. Additionally, we are an independent member of the BDO Alliance USA, a nationwide association of independently owned local and regional accounting and service firms with similar ser client service goals. For more information about our firm, you can visit www.bmss.com. We want to thank you for taking the time to join us for this morning's webinar, BMSS Presents, an AI and Cybersecurity Update. Before we get started, there's a couple of housekeeping items to go over. If during the presentation you have any questions, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. There will also be polling questions. Uh, if you would like to receive CPE credit, please answer those as they pop up. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is all over the news these days, and whether good or bad, we all need to be thinking about what that means for us both professionally and personally. Every morning, we're very fortunate. Oh, this morning, we're very fortunate to have Sarah Glover, Brian Jackson, and Jonathan Prez with us to talk about some of the things we may need to consider as society moves forward in an AI-dominated world. First, let me start by introducing Sarah Glover. As a shareholder in Maynard Nexon's cybersecurity and practice, privacy practice, Sarah heads up cybersecurity risk assessment, <clears throat> data breach response, and cybersecurity compliance and training initiatives. For almost a decade, Sarah has worked on a wide array of management and contract negotiations to help companies bolster their information security programs. She has provided cybersecurity risk assessments for over 100 private equity portfolio companies and has advised a variety of organizations from Fortune 500 companies to tech startups across all industries. Glad to have Sarah. Next, we have Brian Jackson. Brian is the president and COO of Abacus Technologies. In his role, he oversees all executive decisions and operations of the company, along with providing client solutions and development. He began his career in technology by implementing accounting systems, business intelligence solutions, and developing system integrations and now uses that experience to help clients implement and support business applications, computer hardware, network infrastructure, cloud solutions, and cybersecurity processes. Also want to give a special shout out to Brian's mom that's in the audience this morning. Additionally, for the panel discussion portion of the webinar, and to help answer any questions after the presentation, I'd like to introduce Jonathan Purves. Jonathan is the Senior Security Analyst for Abacus Technologies. In his role, he oversees the security team, engineers security solutions for clients, analyzes and uh, remediates security threats, and also spear, spearheads security product development and implementation. With a master's degree in cybersecurity from UAB and as a successful small business owner, he now uses those skills and experience to help develop and enhance Abacus Technologies' rapidly growing security practice. Welcome, Sarah, Brian, and Jonathan. And with that, I'm happy to turn this over to Sarah to begin. 
All right. Thanks, Keith. And good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to be here this morning talking about a very hot topic, as Keith said. Um, AI is everywhere in the news right now. I'm getting constant requests uh, to speak about this topic, to field questions relating to AI, whether it's terms in a contract, uh, new technology that a client is exploring, or just generally wanting to uh, chat about about the the cyber and private cybersecurity and privacy risks associated with the use of AI. Um, when I was putting this presentation together, I asked ChatGPT what it thought a good cover image would be for a set of slides on the legal risks associated with AI, and it suggested a an image of a maze because of the complexity of the legal and privacy issues associated with AI. So I thought that was pretty ominous, uh, but I went with it. Um, and as we'll talk about in a couple of minutes, um, it, it wasn't wrong from that perspective. So next slide, please. All right, so what is AI? Um, a few years ago, before kind of the rise of AI platforms like ChatGPT and others, I think if you had asked most people what AI is, what would come to mind is you know something very sci-fi in nature, movies like Terminator. So you know sentient robots who um, threaten the existence of humankind. Over the past few years, the, the word AI has become more mainstream in terms of what it what it actually means, which is at the end of the day, um, human intellectual needs are getting met in some way by machine intelligence. Um, you know, the term AI is actually really broad and it's often ambiguous, as the FTC has pointed out in this quote that I included here. Um, you know, the... AI can look like a lot of different things and manifest itself in a lot of different ways. So from my perspective, um, you know, the key takeaway from a legal risk standpoint is that there is no single universal definition of AI. And in the legal world, definitions matter because to prescribe something in a statute or a contract, you have to clearly define it. Otherwise, you don't know where the boundaries are. So I think that one of the legal issues that's going to be debated and litigated in the years to come is what do we mean by, by AI? Um, what exactly does that look like? Where's that boundary between ordinary AI and extraordinary AI that may or may not be permissible under a particular law or a contract? Uh, next slide, please. Again, just to shed some light on um, how generative AI models like ChatGPT operate, when I asked ChatGPT to define itself and give me a definition for AI, uh, true to form, the answer was not brief. Um, ChatGPT is, is uh, long-winded um, on its best days. But I think that this definition that ChatGPT gave me does highlight um, sort of the multifaceted characteristics that make up the concept known as AI. So, you know, Brian in a few minutes is going to go into more of the technical components around what is AI, how do AI processes work. But again, the key takeaway for me is that um, when stakeholders are discussing risks relating to AI, or if you are engaging a third party to provide a product or service who is going to leverage AI, you need to be very clear upfront around what that means and what the expectations are around the use of this type of technology. You could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so just like uh, chat GPT warned me, um, the legal issues surrounding the use of AI are complex. And, you know, there are a number of different areas that, that I could flag, but kind of wanted to distill a lot of the, the industry talk right now into a few key, key issues. Because this is such a new area of the law, we really can only speculate at this point as to how certain legal issues may actually be resolved in the courts or in legislatures. And that in and of itself is a risk. You know, the inability to predict 
which way some of these issues will cut is is does itself kind of exacerbate um, the inherent risks in using AI. That will become less and less true as more issues regarding AI are, are sort of worked out on the legal stage. But for now, because it is so new, you know, the unknown um, is itself sort of a global risk that that overarches all of these issues. So, you know, one of the the first things that comes to mind from a legal risk perspective, especially for those who are using or relying on on um, AI to generate content, especially images, is um, intellectual property and and data and content ownership. So, you know, the risk here is really twofold. One is intellectual property infringement. So generative AI models are trained on massive amounts of usually uh, publicly available data. And a lot of that data is probably copyrighted data, um, whether it's you know, text or images. And the use of copyrighted data to train machine learning models could infringe the copyrights of those copyright holders. Or if copyrighted data is input into an AI platform and the output is unique in a sense, but close enough in the IP world um, to infringe the copyrighted material that was input into the model, you know, should the entity that distributes that unique but close uh, content be held liable for copyright infringement? Should the the uh, owner or developer of the AI model be held liable. Um, it didn't have control over what data was input into the model. So there's a lot of issues that come up in terms of how do you enforce copyright rights when you've got these AI models that are relying on so much data and would that even be something that could be monitored in a practical way. The other side of this uh, from an IP standpoint is that you know, when a generative AI model is used to create a product or a design or an image, the issue arises of who owns the rights to that image. If you don't yourself own the AI platform, if you haven't internalized or developed it in-house, you're relying on something that's open source or publicly available, you know, who's going to own the output? If the if a company that you are engaging with is leveraging open source or um, you know external AI platforms to deliver products and services for you, the parties should align on expectations of to who's who's going to own that content. Um, does that ownership right pass to whoever the person who's buying the the content, the products or services? Some AI platform terms of use may also address the issue of ownership up front. So, as with all things in the legal world, when you are using AI platforms, be sure and, and read the fine print before using the platform in any meaningful way. Um, from a data privacy perspective, this is one of the areas that the FTC in particular has gotten a lot of questions and concerns from consumers and consumer rights and advocacy organizations on. Generally speaking, the data privacy risk related to the use of AI is that simply using the AI platform could violate privacy rights and laws. So all AI models, generative AI models anyway, work by ingesting data. So if you input personal data that's regulated by privacy laws into the platform, you could run afoul of statutory schemes that require consent to share an individual's personal data with a third party, which could be construed to include an AI platform or at least the companies that you know maintain and use the AI platform. So simply by putting the data into the model, you could be diminishing the privacy of that data because you are arguably diminishing the right of that individual to control where that data goes, um, who has access to it, what purposes it's used for, all of those things fall under the general realm of privacy rights. And that can get murky when you're talking about um, generative AI. The other side of that coin um, from a data security perspective, at least from a personal information standpoint, is that again, because 
any data you put into an AI model is used by other parties, either immediately or down the road, right? Um, Brian's going to talk about sort of how generative AI works, but essentially um, AI models are constantly learning and building on data that has been input into them in the past. So it's sort of a, it's a, um, it's an accretive process. So information you put into an AI model on day one may becomes a part of the AI processing. It could be used in outputs, you know, in perpetuity down the road. So the data privacy and security risk is not just singular from that perspective. It could, you know, the, the risk keep existing as far as far as the the AI, AI model is operating once that data is input into that model. So from a data security standpoint, you know, again, the risk is is twofold. One is that using certain types of data in AI uh, could be considered a data breach. And then the other is that um, just as legitimate businesses are thinking of very innovative and beneficial ways to use AI, so are the bad guys, right? So, um, you know, again, there's concern that uh, AI models could be used to um, perpetrate cyber attacks, improve social engineering and phishing schemes, for example, allowing threat actors to come up with uh, creative and more believable ways to dupe people into revealing personal information about themselves or falling for a you know financial fraud scheme or giving up their user credentials, things like that. From a data breach perspective, um, you know, simply putting protected data into an AI model could, in certain circumstances, constitute a data breach. So, for example, um, in the U.S., all 50 states have a data breach notification statute that applies according to the residence of the individual. Those state laws typically define breach as unauthorized access to or unauthorized acquisition of personal information. Um, so putting the data into a platform without a person's permission could in and of itself constitute a reportable data breach. That's just one of the ways that a data breach could happen from the use of an AI platform, even unintentionally. Uh, the next area of legal risk really deals with accountability and liability. And we've touched on this some already, but the risk is, is basically that these issues remain unclear when it comes to AI. So, you know, who, when you're using generative AI models, who should be responsible and liable for the AI processing and then the output, the developer of the AI software, the user of the output, who chooses to rely on the output, now, you can't hold the AI model itself liable yet, at least in the current world in which we live. And so at the end of the day, if there's liability to be had, you know, it's an open question as to who bears the ultimate responsibility for those AI platforms. You know, again, this is something that needs to be clearly addressed in, in products and services contracts where one of the parties is going to be leveraging AI. The last area of legal risk that I wanted to flag um, here today is around data integrity, transparency, and bias. So there are numerous examples out in the wild of, um, you know, reasons to doubt that the the output from AI models is trustworthy. Um, after this webinar, if you want a couple of minutes of entertainment today, um, Google. AI hallucinations, and you'll see some, some humorous examples of this concept, which generally describes an AI platform's ability to make up information that may seem true, or it's based in partial truth, but it's, it's clearly not true. So there's one example where um, a researcher asked ChatGPT about the uh, building of the Eiffel Tower, you know, who built it, how did it come to be? And ChatGPT launched into this long explanation that was partially true and, and partially science fiction. So it got the date of build right, the kind of materials, the, you know, the architect, but then it went into this soliloquy about how the common wisdom is that um, the Eiffel Tower was built by aliens and was made possible by alien technology. Who knows where the AI model got that information from? Maybe some combination of being fed too many uh, movie storylines, but that's just an example of a hallucination that an AI model can have. And there's lots of other more practical examples like that out there. 
Um, the other problem with AI models is that there are also numerous examples from a research perspective of AI models exhibiting bias. And if that's left unchecked in AI model use, you know, that could result in discriminatory treatment of individuals. So from a legal perspective, you know, this has been probably the, the most um, primary focus of certain regulators. And I'll get to some of the laws and regulations in just a second. But, um, you know, one of the ways that AI is currently actually being used is in the employment context to screen job applicants or predict um, and measure employee performance, predict employee turnover, that sort of thing. So there are examples out there of AI models making certain assumptions about things like gender roles. So there's a there's another example from a researcher of an, an AI model assuming that the term lawyer describes a male simply because that person is a lawyer. And there are lots of examples like that. Again, the AI output is only good as whatever has been input into the model. So um, bias and, and data integrity is certainly a concern given some of the things that have been observed about AI models. And then the last issue around transparency is that, you know, AI models are often a black box in terms of how the output was created. So this could lead to problems from a legal perspective um, if someone is owed an explanation for how a decision was made that relied upon AI. So if you're denied a loan, for example, and that credit worthiness decision was made in part by an AI model. How do you judge if the decision was fair? Um, how do you appeal a decision made by an AI platform? How do you defend a decision made by an AI platform? So all of those issues um, have, have come up already and regulators are starting to get ahead of some of those things and issue some guidance. So with that, if you could go to the next slide, I'll touch on some of those regulatory uh, pieces. So, um, as of right now, there is no overarching you know, law, uh, U.S. or abroad, that, that governs all use of AI. Um, in the U.S., there have been a lot of bills that have been introduced. A lot of state legislatures are trying to get ahead of this issue, at least in certain contexts. Um, again, in the employment law context, there have been some states who have already passed laws that, have, uh, that regulate the use of AI in employment decisions. So, um, in Illinois, for example, Illinois has passed a law called the Artificial Intelligence Video Interview Act, uh, which regulates employers' use of AI in evaluating job interview videos. Um, New York has passed a law around um, automated employment decision um, tools. So there are strict requirements in New York now on employers that use automated employment decision tools to conduct or assist with hiring. Um, and there are a few other examples like that across the states. At the federal level, the FTC um, is not the only regulator who stepped in to sort of um, say their piece about AI, but they're sort of they're they're one of the first movers for sure. And the FTC has issued um, a few different pieces of guidance over the past twelve months that are definitely worth reading. One of which focuses on the use of AI in marketing. So. Um, the Federal Trade Commission polices unfair and deceptive trade practices uh, across industries. They're industry agnostic. And um, one of the things the FTC looks at, and one of the things that I often look at, um, are the ways that companies market their security practices. And the FTC will, will take companies to task who say things like, all of your data is encrypted on their website and they have a data breach and it's revealed that none of the data was encrypted. So the FTC takes issues with things like that. And they've made it clear that they're going to take the same kind of stance when it comes to AI. So the FTC has said, if you say you use AI, you need to be using AI. Um, and you don't need to exaggerate what an, your AI product can do. And you don't need to promise that your AI product can do something better than a non-AI product if that is not substantiated. So the FTC um, has, has started talking about the ways that it will police um, the use of AI, at least from a marketing standpoint. The FTC and other federal agencies, again, in the employment context, have also just come out and made it known that um, the use of AI is going to be regulated under existing frameworks uh, that deal with discrimination and consumer protection of fair competition, just as any other technology. So basically want the public to know we've got an eye on this technology and we're going to we're going to enforce the existing laws that we have. Um, there's been some laws in Europe, the, the EU AI Act I mentioned here, um, NIST 
has come out with a risk management framework that I'm sure will update over time. Um, but a lot of regulatory and independent bodies are starting to get ahead of, of this issue. The real problem is that um, just like with sort of the data privacy regime globally, it's just a patchwork of laws and guidance. There's no one single source of truth. You've got to sit down and figure out, you know, if you're going to be using AI or using third parties who leverage AI, you've got to have a good understanding of what um, requirements you are subject to because they're all over the place um, and you may be subject to multiple requirements. Next slide, please. Okay, so what do you do with all of that information? Um, you know, I think that there are there are some innovative ways that AI is currently being used and can be used for the betterment of consumers and businesses and society generally. Um, what I would say is that from a legal standpoint, I think that the uh, the guidance says proceed with caution and, and have a plan. So businesses shouldn't go in blind when it comes to the use of AI. Um, you need to assess you know, the business needs around AI. Does your organization have a need to use it? Um, in what instances? and get an understanding for whether you actually need to, to dive into the space, uh, perform a risk assessment. So get an understanding for what requirements you're subject to, what prohibitions against AI use you may need to be monitoring for, decide if the risk is worth, um, worth the risk based on the business need, and then just develop a framework. So, you know, have an acceptable use policy for your employees, for your users. Are you allowed to use AI for what circumstances? Do you have to reveal that you're using AI? Do you have to disclose that? Um, have policies and procedures you can put into place and then monitor and enforce those requirements, right? Policies and procedures don't do anything if if uh, they don't have any teeth to them. So um, I think that just keeping an eye on the way this technology involves and the way that the laws and regulators are evolving with it is going to be important in terms of making sure that your AI risk management platform uh, and, and program makes sense. And then just again, review and update that approach as needed. This is early days for everybody. It's sort of the wild west right now and everyone's figuring it out. And so this is gonna have to be one of those areas that you revisit constantly from a risk management standpoint. What's true today, I'm sure will not be as true in 12 months and there'll be additional issues and that pop up and additional laws and guidance to contend with. So it's something that you need to kind of roll up into your enterprise risk management framework and keep a constant eye on. Next slide, please. All right, I wanted to close with um, some brevity uh, and then just, um, you know, highlight the fact that um, when I asked ChatGPT for the best way to manage legal risk tied to AI, it eventually, when I pressed it, told me that the best thing to do is to hire a good lawyer. So straight from the horse's mouth, if you have uh, concerns around AI or want to go about exploring AI, just know that AI itself would advise you to um, hire a good lawyer. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Brian to delve into the technical world of AI, but certainly happy to answer any questions that come up now or later in the presentation. Thanks so much, Sarah. You want to advance the slide, Grayson? So uh, just want to take a little bit of a break here. I mean, this webinar is very much focused on the risks associated with AI. Um, I'm sure I, I have a whole other presentation on the benefits and future vision of what AI could do your business. So let's keep that in mind as we talk about some of the, the risks associated with it, that there's really a whole other you know, side of AI that I think is really going to benefit our company. It's going to uh, be a force multiplier for our workforces and make our lives a lot easier. Um, but uh, just for a few minutes, we're going to dive into some of these cybersecurity aspects and risk associated with AI, some of the, the use cases that I've seen, and some things I thought were pertinent to share with you uh, today. Uh, next slide. So throughout the presentation, you know, Sarah has used the word generative AI, and just to give it a, a really good definition, uh, it really refers to category of artificial intelligence systems that are designed to generate content that uh, often created, um, although not always, uh, is human-like or contextually relevant. So that is what we see 
uh, when we use a tool or platform like BARD just by Google or uh, chat GPT by OpenAI. These systems mainly use machine learning techniques, uh, deep learning. Uh, they create data content. Uh, you know, now they're capable, of course, of producing text, images, audio, uh, and they learn patterns and uh, develop structures for data using existing data. So a lot of times when you when you think about chat GPT and you think of, you know, what has gone in to create that model, a lot of it is going to be uh, open source information, things that we see and come across on the Internet. So next slide. Now, when it comes to business AI, I think it's important we realize a couple of things here that, you know, we do have AI that is usable in our businesses today. Um, and this is not something that, uh, you know, we're initially going to see come to fruition in most companies probably for another five to 10 years, probably less, but that's the, the typical uh, thought process now. Uh, we are seeing AI being integrated at least to, you know, the point in some of the applications and different platforms we have always, they say it is, you know, to Sarah's point, we don't always tell exactly AI, how AI is integrated into that platform. But right now, when we think of the business use of AI, it's often very narrow. Um, it can perform just a handful of tasks exceptionally well. Um, it does rely heavily on the availability of data. And it's not just data, but really good data for learning. So if you're going to, uh, you know, build a develop, build or develop your own AI platform, you got to have mass quantities of data and it's got to be really good quality in order for that system to learn off of it and then produce the outcomes you're looking for. Realistically, you know, AI is really built to achieve an objective. However, you know, humans, uh, we must still design the objective. So AI is not to the point where uh, it can actually design an objective and then, uh, you know, as the same way that humans can. We still have to design it. And we basically are really just assigning a task to a certain model to achieve an objective. Next slide. And if you want to advance all through these, I think there's a couple of. So artificial intelligence is, is really not something, not a new concept. Uh, so even back in the 1950s, uh, the Turing test was one of the first uh, operations or to actually measure machine intelligence. And it actually became an official field of study in the 50s. But as we see it progress uh, through the decades, uh, you know, probably for most of us in more recent memory, we think of, uh, you know, some of the events in the 90s when Deep Blue uh, which was an IBM platform, defeated, defeated uh, Gary Kasparov in chess. Uh, you know, although we sort of termed that as artificial intelligence, I mean, it was really just machine learning as it came to the game of chess and understanding the strategies and moves associated with that. Um, as we move through even further, uh, we see things like Watson uh, with image recognition, and we see that uh, as a natural learning model, it won uh, Jeopardy. Uh, that's probably something we may have watched or had an opportunity to see ourselves. And, you know, it really wasn't until 2020 and even recently that, you know, artificial intelligence as a platform became uh, mainstream and really a interface was designed to for the everyday person to actually uh, interact with such a platform. And that's where we get chat GPT. Uh, we also have Dolly and a couple others, Bard, that are out there that are now available to us. And it's just a matter of, you know, it's been around for a long time, but we now just have an interface that we can actually interact with it. We can ask it questions. We can uh, post situations to it, and then we can get uh, an answer from those prompts that we provide. So, so AI holistically is not a new technology. It's actually been around for, uh, you know, the better part of, uh, you know, many, many years uh, overall. Next slide. If we look at artificial intelligence and we really start thinking what it is, we really need to break it down to this actually multiple technologies. So if you want to advance the grace a little bit more. So as I look at artificial intelligence, I just don't see it as one platform. It's actually a combination of, of multiple technologies. Uh, we may have expert systems, uh, computer vision, which is about image recognition. Uh, we have machine learning where we see data you know, into a model and it crunches that data to produce an outcome or support decisions. We see it play a part in robotics or autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars. And of course, uh, you know, as most we see it as natural language processing uh, through things like chat GPT. So an AI solution, you know, one that we may interact today or maybe in, in, 
in the future, it's probably going to be a combination of all these technologies. It's not just going to be one simple technology that we just label AI. But we also have to understand that there's risk associated with all these types of technologies.